Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Larry Cretion, and I'm the Executive Director of Green Energy Consumers Alliance. Uh, today, we have a, a great webinar about how to decarbonize the building sector. Um, the title of it is, What is the Clean Heat Standard, and how can we use it to achieve our climate goals? Um, and we have some great guests, and I will proceed now. Uh, this is recorded. Um, and first, an introduction to who we are. Uh, if you're not familiar, we're a nonprofit organization and we have a mission to harness the power of energy consumers to speed the transition to a zero carbon economy. Uh, we were started just a little bit more than 40 years ago uh, in Boston, uh, but we now serve Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We have offices in Boston and Providence. Uh, and we have a uh, funny mix of programs and advocacy. We, we have a lot of programs that consumers can tap into um, to solve an energy problem. Um, uh, solar energy, heat pumps, electric cars, our biggest program by far is uh, green electricity with green municipal aggregation. Um, and a lot of those programs that we operate uh, inform our positions on kinds of public policy that we want to see. We we focus on state energy policy. So we're interested in what uh, the state of Massachusetts and the state of Rhode Island can do uh, that is pro-consumer and uh, pro-environment. Uh, my email address is at the bottom of that slide if you're interested. Um, and we've got a great staff supporting me. We've got Anna van der Speck, uh, Carrie Catan, and others. Um, we have a poll question. Um, Anna, could you put the poll up for people, please? While she's doing that, um, um, uh, the poll must be closed to enable screen sharing. Um, so while uh, the poll is going on, I'll say that we had uh, something like 350 people registered for today's event. Um, all of you who are here, plus those who uh, did not attend, will get uh, the slides emailed out and the recording uh, afterwards, uh, later today. Are we able to, uh, is the poll conducted? I'm not seeing that. Yes, this is Anna's voice jumping in. Um, so far we've got 83% uh, of folks from Massachusetts, 11% from Rhode Island, 2% uh, from other New England states, and 3% from other non-New England states. Uh, okay. And those numbers are are holding pretty firm, so I think that's a, a good representation. I think so too, and, and um, as we'll get into, uh, there's been a bit more talk about clean heat standards in Massachusetts than Rhode Island so far. Um, so that number does not surprise, those results don't uh, surprise me at all. Um, but everybody's welcome. Um, so a few logistics, um, everyone's muted to avoid background noise, except for the participants. Um, if you have questions, uh, and we do encourage questions, there's a, uh, in, in GoToWebinar, there's a box on your screen that you can uh, put questions in, and Anna and others will curate those questions. Sorry, we can't answer every question today, uh, but we'll do our best. We, we will be looking for questions that might have the broadest um, interest. We're, we're going to look for the happy medium in order to, to uh, try to inform everybody. Um, and then uh, we'll answer the questions after our slides. And as I said, we'll share the slides in recording after the webinar. Um, so we have uh, two great guests. We have Richard Cowart and Nancy Seidman from the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, the Regulatory Assistance Project has been uh, working for decades. Um, great work in terms of regulating, uh, providing advice to advocates and to uh, state agencies around the country on electricity and uh, gas particularly, uh, but with the Clean Heat Standard, they're going a little bit broader than that. Um, so I wanna thank Richard and Nancy uh, for coming. Um, our organization's thought a lot about Clean Heat Standards recently, the last couple of years, but if there's one group that's thought about it more than we have, it would be the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, the reason I asked Richard and Nancy to be here today is um, the state of Massachusetts did a clean energy and climate plan in 2022, 
and um, with a, re a large number of recommendations for policy going forward. Uh, the Massachusetts Clean Heat Commission, uh, same thing, and both documents um, reference the, the uh, need for a clean heat standard, um, and they actually had the Regulatory Assistance Project write a chapter in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan describing kind of what the contours of a clean heat standard would look like. Um, so I think we've got some great experts who will walk us through that. Um, and uh, they're not proposing a particular piece of legislation or regulations. They're short, sort of describing to us what the clean heat standard might look like. When they're done with their presentation, I'll have some questions for them, and then we'll open it up uh, to you all. Um, so real br briefly, what are we talking about? How do we decarbonize the heating sector? Well, we can do it through weatherization, good old insulation and air sealing, uh, energy efficiency overall in general. But in particular here, we're talking about the essential need to electrify uh, building heating, homes and businesses. So we're talking about heat pumps, including uh, geothermal or ground source heat pumps, including uh, network geothermal, uh, things like that. Heat pump water heaters, because it's not just the space heat, it's also the water. Um, and things like electric clothes dryers and induction stoves, all those things can reduce the amount of um, fuel that we would uh, are going to combust within buildings um, in in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and any other state. Uh, and a a real question is the extent to which um, the state should encourage low carbon fuels, things like uh, perhaps biodiesel with respect to as a as a uh, uh, as a complement to uh, heating oil, um, but uh, there's concern here. Uh, the gas utilities will be suggesting that we uh, incorporate renewable natural gas or hydrogen uh, into the pipelines that bring gas to our homes and businesses. I just want to make it very clear, there's no hidden agendas with Green Energy Consumers Alliance. We would oppose that. We strongly oppose that. So we're encouraging a clean, a good clean heat standard that would exclude the possibility of having uh, renewable natural gas and hydrogen uh, as something that would earn what is called clean heat credits, which Richard and Nancy will explain to us a little bit further. So um, going further, so what are the goals here? Um, well, by law, Massachusetts uh, has to, and Rhode Island are both have laws that say we're going to get to essentially net zero by 2050, um, and that's economy-wide. In Massachusetts, by 2030, it's 50% uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Rhode Island's a 45% greenhouse gas reduction. Um, almost the same. The same general ideas apply. Um, Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan is looking at a uh, building sector reduction of 49%. Um, why it's not 50%, I don't know, but it's close enough essentially cutting in half the emissions uh, from the building sector. The Rhode Island uh, plan is not as detailed. It's not clear to us, but I think we can say that if it wants to achieve the reductions like 45% uh, economy-wide, that's really good what they have to be looking at. Uh, and we encourage Rhode Islanders to pay attention to asking the state for more detail. And, and the biggest point I wanna make is in order to do that, we have to impact not just new construction, and not just ex existing structures, but all of them, a large and small buildings, residential and commercial. And there are a lot of policies that might get at one or the other of those items, but we need something that's going to work for all building space. And just a, a fun fact, it's approximately 70% of the square feet of buildings that's gonna, gonna be standing up in 2050 is already in existence in 2023. So um, we can have great policies for, uh, new construction, but we've got to um, go after uh, uh, building retrofits as well. Um, so there are a large number of policy options, and uh, we're not saying that a clean heat standard is should stand alone. Um, so we want to emphasize that. So one one idea is to a lot of discussion about uh, amplifying the existing energy efficiency programs that are work in the states, Mass Save and uh, Massachusetts and then Rhode Island Energy has a similar program. Um, and, the, and the thought process is, well, can we um, do so with a new emphasis on heat pumps? And uh, so I've written about this in a blog. Where would the money come from in order to do that? Uh, one of the 
biases that I have or we have is we don't want to keep raising the electricity rate in order to fund those kinds of programs because that's counterproductive. We're trying to get people to electrify their buildings and to get electric cars. So we've got to figure out how are we going to um, uh, get the existing programs to uh, phase out fossil fuels. Another idea that we strongly support is building performance standards. Boston has um, a standard called BIRDO, uh, Buildings Emission Reduction Ordinance, that requires large buildings, 20,000 square feet and up, to annually reduce the amount of uh, emissions that would come from that building. We'd like to see that done statewide in both states. Um, there's a lot of talk in Massachusetts, there are more than talk. There's a law that says that 10 cities and towns will be able to ban new gas hookups. And a lot of cities and towns are gonna to adopt a specialized stretch code that will push the envelope on building codes. And we wanna see more of that in both states. We're supporting some legislation in, in, uh, in those areas. Um, New York, the governor of New York is looking at banning uh, by a certain date, 2030 or 2035, the ability of someone to purchase a new fossil fuel heating system. Uh, that's essentially where we have to go, we believe, because if you uh, buy a heating system today, it's gonna last maybe 40, 50 years, way past the 2050 point at which we should have uh, zero emissions from the building sector. So within that context, how does a clean heat standard fit? Um, what I'm trying to say here with this slide is, we can't get the job done with any one policy. We're gonna need to have um, at least a few. Um, the object of the game and our viewpoint is we need some sort of a macro policy or set of policies that would phase out fossil fuels, offer consumer choices, and protect low and moderate income uh, consumers. Um, so we're saying if you hear anything about the clean heat standard that you like or don't like today, just remember, particularly if you don't like it, what are we gonna do in order to reduce emissions by the amount the laws say? We've got to adopt some of these proposals, if not all of them. Um, so how are, when we say adopting proposals, we have legislative uh, uh, possibilities and we have regulatory possibilities. Um, both governors have full authority to institute a clean heat standard uh, that would have the authority to get everything done that we're, we're saying 50% by 2030 and zero by 2050. They, the governors have the authority to do it by regulation. Um, nonetheless, um, we wanna give a shout out to Representative Bill Driscoll in Massachusetts. He represents Milton and Randolph. He has filed legislation in this session called an act relative to the clean heat standard. And um, we worked with him on this one. It's, a, it's essentially a Massachusetts version of legislation that is moving through the Vermont legislature. Um, and uh, we invite other people to take a look at that because we just wanted to get that into uh, the by the filing deadline. And it certainly is available for, uh, we're available to talk about uh, tweaking it in order to make it uh, even better than it is. Um, wanna make the point, greenhouse gas limits are by set for 2030 are binding. Uh, they have to be accomplished. Otherwise, the states are open to lawsuit. And we don't wanna see that happen. We wanna see the policies enacted early so that we can achieve those reductions on time. And so I, again, I'll keep repeating this. If we're if not a clean heat standard, then what are we gonna do in order to get the emission reductions that are required already by law? Uh, so we're kind of trying to help out Massachusetts policymakers by at least um, putting out for discussion the clean heat standard as a, as, as a viable option. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, as I said before, and uh, you know, hopefully you agree with our mission and uh, you like the programs that we have and the advocacy work that we do. And if you're able to make a donation to us, uh, please do. You can go to our website and look for the donate page. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nancy from the Regulatory Assistance Project and uh, she will uh, do a few slides and then over to Richard and then we'll do questions. Nancy, Great. take it away. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, thank you for the introductions and uh, for the introduction to the issues. Um, good afternoon to everyone. We wanna thank Larry and uh, the Green Energy Consumers Alliance for hosting this webinar and inviting us to speak. Uh, I'm Nancy Seidman, a senior advisor at RAP. 
Uh, Richard Cowart and I are glad to be here addressing the important issues of developing and implementing a clean heat standard. Uh, RAP is a non-governmental organization with teams in the US, Europe, India, and China. We're composed primarily of former, uh, could you go back one please? Um, yep. Composed primarily of former regulators working to develop and advance an equitable clean energy future for all consumers. Um, at RAP, I work primarily on clean energy and environmental policies um, and their overlap. And I spent over 20 years with NASDAQ EP in addition to other positions in New England before joining RAP. Um, as Larry mentioned, I'm up first, then Richard, and we look forward to the questions posed by Larry and all of you. Uh, next slide, please. So as Larry mentioned, the reason we're here today is that in RAP's view, reducing emissions from fossil heat is a huge challenge. Um, for perspective, in Massachusetts, um, space heating comprises about 34% of the greenhouse gas emissions. That's from Massachusetts data. Um, and primarily, that's the primarily space heating emissions, but also includes hot water and some industrial processes and some other uh, sectors, smaller sectors. Uh, we don't have specific Rhode Island data that we're sharing, but but we believe that Rhode Island has a fairly consistent profile to Massachusetts. And if Ma the Commonwealth's and Rhode Island's overall climate goals are to be met, then very large reductions in fossil heat are needed. So combined that with an urgent need to address the inequities in heating, the heating sector, such as substandard housing, expensive heating sources like oil or electric resistance, and high energy burdens for those least likely to be able to afford them. You know, we need, we know we need to consider these issues and we look forward to talking with you about those a lot today. And finally, changing over existing buildings is a slow process and is going to require patience, a lot of money, and a knowledgeable workforce, among other things. Uh, next slide, please. So per, to provide a bit more detail on Massachusetts, and again, we believe this is similar in Rhode Island, here's a little bit more detailed information on the fossil fuel greenhouse, thermal fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Recall that about 34% of the state's total, um, so this is an a enlargement of that sector, about 34%. Um, I'll call your attention to the ratios of pipeline gas, fuel oil, and propane that's on the left there, the 65% and the 35% that is uh, made up from this pie chart or combined from this pie chart, and the breakdown in terms of residential, commercial, and industrial um, in terms of the largest sector being residential at 54%, whereas pipeline gas makes up the largest amount of the fuel use. And then in the pie chart, I think it's worth pointing out the residential fossil gas portion, which is in yellow, the residential fuel oil portion, which is in aqua, at least it sort of looks like aqua on my screen, um, and the commercial fossil gas in the dark blue then on the left. So this data is very important because it's used to figure out how, where, when, obligations should be assigned for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from this sector and the pace of change that can or should be achieved given the options available and the costs to consumers. Next slide, please. So to provide a very high level overview of the clean heat standard, and we'll be delving into all of this, you know, more this afternoon, here's what we consider a clean house, clean heat standard. Uh, here's a few relevant points. The first is that it can be seen as being similar to a renewable portfolio standard in terms of requiring an increasing percentage of something like renewable energy, in this case, clean heat, to be available and committed to to consumers over time. But an important difference here, as I just mentioned, is now the focus is on customers or consumers, not on the supply, for example, of electricity. The second thing is we want to provide a range of choices for consumers. Some of the most are there mentioned and Larry mentioned them as well, not new or surprising to you, like weatherization, efficiency, heat pumps, uh, different fuels. Third would be the obligated parties, which we'll discuss in detail today and what options they're required to offer to consumers. 
And then ending with um, the ability to create credits or purchase credits from providing choices and options and installing clean heat options, which you can see as being similar to some of the market-based programs that we have implemented in New England, like the CAP and INVEST programs. So this is kind of the high level overview of what a clean heat stand, how we see a clean heat standard as a performance standard with an obligation to consumers, providing options and creating credits, and most importantly, reducing emissions. Um, next slide, please. So to provide additional context on how a clean heat standard fits within other similar policies, this is a slide showing the other types of, of things that are considered performance, that at least we consider performance standards around the country. Again, we talk about renewable portfolio standards and that there's about 30 states with requirements like that. There's 25 states who have energy efficiency uh, performance standards. There's a number of states who have low carbon fuel standards, which is seen as a similar type of a program. Um, and we have clean heat standards that are being developed in New England, um, which we're talking about today, as well as other areas like Colorado. And so all of these provide options and ideas that we're trying to build upon. Um, the data on this slide is from a database that's called, it's pronounced DESIRE, D-S-I-R-E. Um, I believe it's out of the University of North Carolina um, and it's 2020 data. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide begins our discussion of the details of a clean heat standard, which Richard is going to get into in the second half of the presentation, particularly in view of the work of, that we've done, as well as many others in Vermont and Massachusetts. So here's what we view as the key issues. First, what is, what is the regulatory requirement of the program? What is our goal? Is it framed as reducing greenhouse gas emissions given legislation, for example, as we've seen you know, in Massachusetts? Is it framed in terms of reducing consumers' cost for heating? And then given those goals, how is that goal to be achieved? Importantly, what is the metrics that's used to determine success? Is it reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, tons of greenhouse gas emissions? And what is the obligations of regulatory parties to meet those requirements? Second, who is obligated to meet those goals? What types and ranges of fuel suppliers? Is it just the gas suppliers? Is it the fuel oil plus the fuel oil suppliers plus the propane suppliers plus the electricity suppliers? Some or all of those uh, groups. How fast, third, how fast are they obligated to meet the goals? What is the trajectory of achieving the goals? And fourth, again, of particular importance, how, in terms of equity, how do we ensure that all consumers and customers share in the benefits of clean heat? How do we achieve that? How, does it, how is it framed in terms of the obligation of the parties, in terms of their commitments to make sure that happens? Next, so what types of actions being done for consumers? earn credits that can be used to demonstrate you've met the obligation. Next, importantly, what is included or excluded from those credits? Um, a fun one always to talk about is the whether to include or exclude biomass in the types of actions and heat that is included by the program. And finally, the mechanics of the program are really important so that we ensure that the goals are demonstrated to have been met or if not, what happens if they're not, and to think about how the program may need to be adjusted in the future to make sure that we do meet the goals. Mechanics such as accounting for the credits, tracking the credits, how you could trade credits, how you enforce the provisions of the program. So go, please go to the next slide, and with that, I will turn things over to Richard. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks Larry, thanks Nancy. That's a great setup. Uh, my job this afternoon is to take you through um, in a bit more detail some of the uh, factors that both of them have already mentioned. Um, let's just go to the next slide. 
as as mentioned uh, by Larry in the intro, um, in both Vermont and Massachusetts, there has been action building on the state's climate plans uh, to urge consideration or adoption of a clean heat standard. The Vermont Climate Council um, very definitely proposed a clean heat standard and urged the legislature to adopt it as rapidly as possible. Last year, that was vetoed by the governor and very narrowly failed an override vote. And we have a revised bill now in the Vermont Senate. Uh, the legislature is continuing to work on that. Uh, in Massachusetts, as Larry mentioned, the Commission on Clean Heat recommended establishing a clean heat standard. Um, and so I would expect that this will be under consideration in Massachusetts uh, in coming months. Uh, next slide. As, as Nancy said, the nature of the obligation is, you know, an important first uh, step in the design of a program. And in both cases, um, the focus is on greenhouse gas emission reduction. In both cases, the proposals are coming out of the goals of the climate action plans. And so, you know, as we often say in talking about the design of this program, we're counting tons. We're basically counting tons of reduction as opposed to counting uh, widgets or just counting the number of heat pumps installed or the number of uh, square feet of space that is weatherized. Uh, what we're really looking for is to ensure that we stay on path to reduce emissions from the thermal sector according to the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act in both Vermont and in Massachusetts. The, the next question, as Nancy pointed out, is, well, that's a great goal, but on whom are we going to place the obligation? And uh, in Vermont, because we've, we've gone through in the entire program design and we've uh, enacted, or we have come very close to enacting legislation where this is detailed, uh, we can be specific about it. Uh, Vermont, unlike Massachusetts, is very dependent on delivered fossil fuels, uh, propane and fuel oil. And so we did not want to create a clean heat standard that applied only to the natural gas pipeline company. Uh, so in the case of Vermont, the obligation is applied to fossil fuel providers at the point of importation. We, the, the design is to um, go higher in the fossil fuel delivery chain um, so that it's the importers under the uh, statute who are uh, obliged to obtain clean heat credits. A ditto for the gas uh, pipeline utility. In Massachusetts, there was there has been some conversation on whether some fraction of the obligation should be uh, borne by electric companies. Um, there are a variety of policy reasons, pro and con, on that. As Larry pointed out, um, in Vermont anyway, the conclusion was we already require the electric companies to bear uh, most of the responsibility for decarbonizing energy so far. So uh, I think it's time for the fossil fuel providers uh, to bear a portion of the obligation. Where are credits earned? Um, it's really important to make, uh, you know, to sort of emphasize this point. The goal is to ch transform the way, I apologize for that, the way um, heat is provided in the, uh, in the thermal sector in the state and the um it it's not a theoretical construct of well we're going to avoid some carbon emissions somewhere in the world uh, we actually want to improve heating as it's delivered um in to customers in the state of massachusetts in the state of vermont in the state of rhode island uh, very physical very tangible um customer service uh, provision and how are we going to measure those savings the common denominator, the currency that we use is carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
as Nancy mentioned, uh, and as Larry mentioned, um, there are a lot of opportunities to, do, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the thermal sector. Um, it's kind of easy for us to uh, you know, start with weatherization and energy efficiency because efficiency first you know, has always been a principle, certainly an important principle uh, that RAP has promoted for many years. Uh, heat pumps are um, high on the list. The next question is to what degree shall we include uh, some degree of biofuels or renewable gases? Uh, we'll turn to that um, later and I'm sure in the Q&A. Uh, district heating is, uh, whoops, can you go back? Oh, yeah, district heating, solar thermal and, and so forth. Um, the last two bullets on this slide are, are important considerations. You have to recognize that unlike a renewable portfolio standard, uh, where actions can be taken essentially at the at the far end of a transmission line and customers really don't have to do anything, um, they don't have to change anything in their homes or businesses um, in order for the utility to satisfy the RPS. In the case of a clean heat standard, Achieving the standard requires individual customers, individual building owners to make changes in the heating infrastructure or the fuels that they uh, use for heat. And so I sometimes refer to this as the 100,000 kitchen table conversations problem. Uh, this isn't something that happens at the other end of the transmission line. This is something that has to happen in individual homes and businesses. Another important feature of a clean heat standard uh, goes to the question of who can earn credits. Uh, when we first started talking about this, people would say, well, can an obligated, does an obligated party uh, have to earn credits just by improving heating systems of their own customers? Um, or can they maybe do the work somewhere else? And an expansion of that idea is, well, there are a lot of people delivering the kind of benefits that Larry talked about earlier. Uh, there are weatherization programs, there are other efficiency programs, utilities sometimes have fossil, uh, thermal fossil reduction programs. Uh, there are many pathways to delivering these credits. And when you consider that they have to be delivered physically in, hundreds of thousands or millions of customer locations, we need a lot of boots on the ground. And so the idea that anyone can earn credits is a key feature of a clean heat standard. Uh, next slide. I think the next slide is guardrails, thank you. Okay, in the design of the clean heat standard, uh, as Nancy uh, and Larry have both mentioned, Equity um, is a hugely important uh, feature of the program design. Uh, there's, there's just no way that we can um, decarbonize the heating sectors in our states without putting at the top of the list a concern for energy burdens and energy affordability and equity. So the progressive inclusion mandate, uh, which is now included in the Vermont legislation, uh, requires a, a uh, positive fraction of all the clean heat credits that are earned um, by the obligated parties to be secured by services delivered to low and moderate income households. Uh, there are a lot of details associated with how we do that, but. Um, maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see a progressive inclusion mandate included in any clean heat standard adopted in you know, today's world. Credits are measured on a net life cycle basis. We're not just measuring burner tip emissions here. We don't want to replace uh, burner tip emissions uh, with effectively life cycle uh, emissions that are higher somewhere else in the world. So uh, total life cycle analysis is 
uh, what we have recommended in uh, Vermont, and I would expect Massachusetts to do the same. As Larry mentioned earlier, there's there is <clears throat> a, a lot of concern about developing reliance on uh, <clears throat> fuels that might not be actually cleaner in the long term than uh, installed measures and per that will permanently reduce customers' bills and and ensure really long-term uh, emission reductions. And so weatherization and heat pumps, for example, uh, can be uh, encouraged or promoted under the design of the program. Uh, limits on biofuels, again, we should maybe get into this in the Q&A. This has been uh, considered very carefully in the Vermont legislation and some techniques um, to both use um, some degree of the highest quality, cleanest biofuels as needed uh, without incurring undue reliance on them uh, as part of the program design. And finally, the question of cost containment. Um, a lot of the actions that could be done to deliver a clean heat credit um, require upfront capital costs that uh, are not so easy to come by. Um, and we have to come up with ways to finance that. We have to come up with ways to write down, uh, minimize the costs on low and moderate income households for uh, participating in the program. Uh, and overall for the, uh, you know, the public at large, we need a program design that uh, can be accomplished because it's fundamentally affordable. We've concluded in, in Vermont that the, um, the programs that we're talking about will over time uh, substantially lower the state's total heating bill, but getting the investments on the ground in order to do that is, is not a, a simple proposition. And next slide. This is uh, the conclusion slide. We've been working on this idea for more than two years and uh, have been talking to quite a number of people around the country and including in, in, in European countries as well about what's, you know, what's the reason, fundamental reason for a clean heat standard. Uh, at the beginning, Larry mentioned a number of complementary policies that have been used or could be used in order to deliver uh, savings in the thermal sector. And when you look at each one of them, by it itself, it, we conclude that it would not be adequate to drive the level of change that we need. Um, lots of people have documented that incentives alone uh, aren't strong enough to drive change at the pace that we need. Um, public funds and taxes, uh, sometimes people say, well, let's just uh, you know appropriate some money and we'll weatherize some homes or subsidize some heat pumps. Um, not reliable enough over the decades of the work that lies ahead of us. Uh, building codes and bans, as Larry pointed out, can be terrific, uh, but will only affect a portion of the existing building stock. And the turnover rate for fossil appliances is too slow to meet the um, reduction pace that we need. And businesses need a predictable path. Um, people who, are, who would like to build a clean energy solutions business, whether it be a weatherization business, uh, a heat pump installation business, uh, any kind of conversion business, uh, need to know that this policy is going to be in effect for a number of years. And just as we learned in the, in the renewables world, uh, when the policies are stop, start, stop, a start, uh, businesses uh, can't raise the capital, can't hire the workforce um, in order to deliver progressive savings year after year after year uh, for the next couple of two or three decades. Um, the clean heat standard allows multiple delivery pathways. Lots of different ways to earn credits. Lots of different people can earn credits. 
not everybody wants a heat pump. Not every building is suitable for conversion to heat pumps using today's technology, even though they might be a decade from now. Uh, we, we need to be open to multiple pathways. And finally, um, customers have to make these decisions. Uh, you know, you think about a couple hundred thousand um, kitchen table conversations where customers have to decide to do something. Um, it's important that they have a choice and we're not gonna be able to deliver the savings unless uh, they do have that choice. And finally, um, performance standards have been shown to work. I think the performance standards in the energy efficiency world uh, and in the renewables world teach us that um, this can be a viable principal policy driver for savings in the thermal sector. And I think that's it, and we're open to questions. Uh, Richard and Nancy, that was excellent. Uh, thank you very much. We do have some really good questions uh, in the queue, um, and so we'll go, go right to those. Um, the, your last slide, the one that's sh still showing, is is really where I'm coming from. Um, so I appreciate the the way you laid it out for us. Um, so I'll start with a question. Um, uh, it's directed at, at Rich. Um, Referencing the fact that I said our organization would oppose uh, providing clean heat credits for renewable natural gas and hydrogen. His question is, would a clean heat standard that excludes renewable natural gas and hydrogen be less effective? Would it be more expensive? And and how would uh, you treat, um, and, and then how would the inclusion of biofuels affect the consumer? Um, I guess it's a, I'll ask it in a two-part way. Could you address the issue of renewable natural gas and hydrogen, and then a different story is is biodiesel with respect to heating oil? Okay, um, right to the right to the thorny question. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I would actually I, I would actually um, call it three questions. Um, let's take renewable natural gas. Um, well, let's let's take the overall topic. I think any state can choose um, in developing a clean heat standard what resources to include, um, exclude, and affirmatively promote. So um, RAP would say there's no single answer to this. It's just, this is a question for individual states to decide based upon the circumstances that they face. Um, and the you know, different states have rather different uh, sources of heat today, and they are exist in different climate regimes. And so, you know, the problem of dealing with really cold winters in Vermont is different from the problem of dealing with winters in Maryland. So that, let's just say first, um, it's a decision that states can take. Second, at least in theory, to the degree that resources are excluded from the potential solution mix um, at the first, you know, first glance, that would appear to um, potentially raise the total cost of achieving the goals. Um, I think that bears close analysis for individual cases. Uh, but let's take our now. Having said that as all a prelude, let me get down to the individual case. Renewable natural gases exist in a variety of forms. Um, there, there are cases of methane um, reduction from say a, a landfill where the landfill gas is either gonna be flared or it could be um, recovered and used for, uh, to displace fossil gas. Uh, Certainly, this argument has come up in Vermont, and the Vermont legislation has a provision in it that requires uh, any RNG to be qualified only if it can be proven that that methane would otherwise have been vented and wouldn't have been um, reduced through an existing, some other existing regulatory framework. Um, so it's very limited. Uh, there isn't all that much RNG, really, 
um, in the world. The idea that RNG could be created for the purpose of, you know, uh, for the purpose of satisfying the clean heat credit uh, at, in the Vermont legislation uh, is forbidden. The, the also all fuels in the Vermont legislation are subjected to life cycle uh, net life cycle analysis, and so not no fuel credit is given except where it is demonstrated on a life cycle basis to reduce emissions compared to what would have been burned uh, in the end use. And that same, uh, this same uh, logic would apply to hydrogen. Uh, there's, a, and a, the argument has been made, you know, pretty frequently that there are some high temperature industrial applications for which hydrogen seems to be a possible solution. And the, and wraps, opinion about this is that hydrogen uh, is a very limited scarce resource green truly green hydrogen is a limited scarce resource and should be used only for those applications for which there is no other uh, reasonable uh, option which basically means don't waste it by putting it in pipelines it needs to be directly uh, produced for the purpose of limited high temperature usually industrial applications. Um, as for biofuels, biofuels are similarly exist across a wide range of life cycle um, characteristics. And the first question is whether you, whether they would be permitted at all. Second question is um, if they are permitted, or do we have thresholds? for how uh, low carbon they have to be in order to be used at all. The Vermont legislation includes a provision with an increasing um, performance standard on any biofuel that would be used you know, in, in the state for clean heat credits. Um, over time, only uh, biofuels that are demonstrated on a life cycle basis to reduce emissions quite substantially um, would be allowed. I think I've touched on all of those. Um, you, you, all you of those. Richard, um, do, do you have any comments on the um, potential supply of biofuels, particularly biodiesel, um, is whether or not that would be a, a, even if it could pass the test of being a lower, uh, uh, lower emissive uh, fuel than, than uh, heating oil, which is essentially diesel fuel. Um, do you think there's a significant supply that it would help Massachusetts or Rhode Island uh, increase its percentage of biofuels in that application? Well, the biofuels industries, you know, says that there's a great, there's a, the potential is rather significant. And um, both well, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York have recently adopted fuel blending mandates, I think, based on uh, what they've heard about the, the su available supply. Um, I'm not an expert enough to tell you whether the quantity exists, um, but the following observation has certainly been made in Vermont. I mean, in, in Vermont households today, Vermont households are 75% dependent on delivered fuels. In Massachusetts, that's more like 25%. Uh, but in, the, in those households, if what people have already in their home is a, either a propane tank or an oil tank and a furnace. And the, and I'm now, I'm now uh, how do you say it? Based on an assumption that a biofuel can be delivered that is demonstrated on a life cycle basis to be better than fuel oil, uh, if that's true, then emission reductions can be achieved fairly quickly and at relatively low cost by substituting biofuel for fossil fuel. And that doesn't mean it's the best long term solution, uh, but it means that some of emission reductions in the near term could be 
supplied at relatively low cost without having to insulate the home, without having to install, convert the home to heat pumps. And, and certainly in Vermont, that is considered to be a transitional method that we should uh, be willing to examine closely. Uh, very good. We, we might come back to that one. Uh, the whole issue. Can I chime in on one thing, Larry, on this? I mean, I think what it points, all of what Richard's been saying, points to the importance of how the accounting mechanisms and the life cycle emissions are calculated, and whether people who are part of the system and the consumers believe that those are demonstrating to them that they are making an improvement in their emissions profile. That is all incredibly complicated and technical. Um, and I, so I think it's up to all of us who work in this area to think about what, what should be acceptable in terms of accounting for those right. reductions, but as or before and during, we're talking about which options are creditable. Yeah, I, it, I'm sorry to chime in back. I realized I, there's something I did not say. Um, California, Oregon, Washington have low carbon fuel standards for the transportation sector. And uh, they use uh, life cycle emissions accounting for it, to deciding how to credit all the fuels that they use under that program. Um, and the US EPA and others have established some protocols for measuring these life cycle uh, emissions. Some of these protocols are controversial. Some people find fault with some of them. Some people like them. But California, uh, for example, uses them in their low carbon fuel standard. There are hundreds and hundreds of these assessments. And so it's really important for people to understand that under those uh, assessment protocols, some biofuels are really horrible and some biofuels look like on a life cycle basis, uh, they actually reduce emissions long-term. Very good. Uh, so we might come back to that, but moving on, there, there's some other great questions. Uh, people are asking questions that I think I would have liked to have thought I would have asked. Um, Paula is making a comment, uh, more than a question though. When thinking about promoting equity, uh, it, it's good to think about sharing the benefits of uh, the clean heat standard, but also how to prevent harms like increasing energy burden. Um, and you mentioned that in terms of uh, a progressive inclusion mandate. Could you touch on that? It, the, there's another question um, that, that I'll throw out there, which is, Somebody was pointing out, it, it, is it difficult to have the standard be aggressive enough to drive emissions down on one hand, but also uh, also trying to pro provide some uh, rate protection uh, or price protection to people who are low and moderate income? Um, you want to address that, Richard or Nancy? I'm happy. To, I'm happy to say, is it difficult? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, we're dealing with multiple objectives when you think about it. The one is reducing emissions from the thermal sector, just getting tons on a, you know, on a relatively steep path of reductions. Uh, it's, it, the companion goal is to do so equitably. A third goal is to make sure that the end result is affordable for everybody else. Um, and so those things are are somewhat uh, in tension. And I guess I would also add that there's a there's there's a, a fourth corner to this square, uh, which is how practical how practical is it? How realistic is it in um, to achieve these goals on the pace that we need to achieve them? You know, do we have the workforce? Do we have the ability to uh, convert this many uh, buildings so quickly? And do we maybe have to consider some transitional policies that we might not want permanently, but we might need to use uh, on the way? So those things are all intention. Uh, there's no perfect solution. The 
the good news is that one thing we do know is that continued reliance on imported fossil fuels is an expensive and volatile proposition. So for our states, a, a policy that moves us um, to renewable and more locally produced uh, heating resources is inherently a positive move. Um, now, with respect to the progressive inclusion requirement, I can just tell you what the Vermont legislation currently pending uh, includes. It states that the obligated parties have to deliver a certain amount of clean heat credits uh, every year. It states that the portion of those credits that comes from delivering services to low and moderate income households, so that portion is larger than the fraction of low and moderate income households existing in the state. So, and it's a pretty substantial differential. So I, I can tell you what my thinking about this is. My thinking has been as follows. We know that ultimately we have to convert virtually every household in the state to cleaner heat. If we know we're going to have to do that over time, why not start with the most energy burdened households first and disproportionately but not exclusively deliver benefits in those segments early in the program design that will moderate the the secondary effect that you asked about which is well what about price increases on everybody else who hasn't yet had the chance to participate in the program and uh it may be that for the uh, lowest income households, there needs to be a companion policy and an increase in support in uh, fuel assistance programs and the like. And that would be perfectly compatible with what we're talking about. But it, it would be naive to think that we're going to be able to make uh, all the transitions that we're talking about here without somebody paying increased costs uh, somewhere. Uh, Richard, I agree. I think I think you, uh, Nancy. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I just I want to say it's been encouraging in both Vermont and Massachusetts to see that the policymakers are bringing in a number of all the right people, at least at the agency levels, and in Vermont, in the case of at the advocate level as well, as I understand from Richard, to talk about this host of issues that have to be addressed. I mean, what you're pointing to, Larry, obviously costs crosses, as you know, multiple agencies in every state and requires that the solutions be designed across those agencies. So I think one message for the for advocate community is, is to acknowledge that and to be working with as many arms, if you will, of the state who will have to be part of the solutions and development of this these programs. Right. Um, I would two-part sort of response to that. One is, um, I don't have the data handy at, uh, by memory, but looking at the uh, what the gas utilities in Massachusetts have um, sold in terms of gas, uh, a very small percentage of their of that, uh, le much less than, I think it's less than 5% of gas is sold to low-income consumers. Uh, most of it is, as you pointed out, is commercial, industrial, and then to non-low income customers. Um, you can sort of extrapolate that to, to the delivered fuels uh, world as well. My, my point in saying that is I, I do think it's possible to provide some protection um, uh, to, to the population that is, would be most burdened and, and try to hold them as harmless as we can uh, because most of the fuel is not consumed by them. So, we, so I, I think it's possible. It's not easy, as you said, but I do think we can do that. Um, uh, separate topic now. Um, people are saying, well, if we're going to offer clean heat credits and we're going to have obligated entities, um, they're trying to see how all this works. It, it, hopefully the result is people weatherize their home or they install a heat pump or what have you. Uh, but a term that often comes up in a form like this is, is there something like an alternative compliance payment component to a clean heat standard, 
um, where you know if you were a gas utility or a heating oil dealer and you couldn't figure out how to earn credits, you, is there a place you could write a check? Uh, and and if you, I know you've thought that through. Could you describe how you would see an alternative compliance payment component uh, incorporated into all this? And how would the reporting structure uh, support that? Um, Nancy, do you want to go first on that or you want? So um, the answer is yes. Uh, we recognize the need for a, an alternative compliance payment mechanism. And um, but the prelude to this is the is the fact that anybody can earn credits under this system. So let's just say a gas utility or a fuel dealer uh, who otherwise has an obligation doesn't really want to get into the weatherization business or what have you. Um, but weatherization agencies, even existing weatherization agencies, can earn credits for the work that they're doing. Those credits are then available to be sold to the obligated parties. So that's really the first um, place where an obligated party would go. If on the other, if for some reason, the, there are, just aren't enough credits in, the, in, in that market, that, and I'll call it, it's an informal market that we anticipate. We don't anticipate a, an auction regime with a kind of a fancy trading floor and that kind of thing. Um, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet where a, a responsible government agency keeps track of who's got credits and who needs credits. But if they don't, if they're unable to buy credits in that, in that market, then yes, they could make an alternative compliance payment. And then the default delivery authority um, that would be, uh, the, I mean, there needs to be a, a default delivery mechanism of some kind where the, the regulator that is supervising this entire program um, takes that money and hands it over to the default uh, agency. And that could be used uh, in a variety of ways, but most people say, well, why don't we use that to promote the low-income weatherization programs or the low-income heat, heat pump programs? So we further focus attention on low and moderate income. Uh, very good. Um, by my analysis, you know, we have to reduce fossil fuel usage, whether it's gas, oil, propane, by, I forget, four to five percent per year um, to at least get uh, on the curve as we need. Um, a question Peter asks is, that, does the clean heat standard uh, become more or less effective as it uh, over time? Um, Will it be, you know, some people are going to, uh, homes and businesses are going to adopt clean heat solutions. Um, someone's going to earn credits from those. But as time goes on, will it get harder or more or easier for those who are still on fossil fuels? Are we going to need uh, more carrots or more sticks in order to move them over to the cleanest possible solutions? Do you want to speak to that one, Nancy? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'm sure I'll, you can, and then you can chime in. Um, do we need more carrots and sticks? Yes, I would say. And does it become easier or harder? Also, yes, I would say yes to both of those. I mean, ideally, as you scale up, you know, the heat pump production now, the U.S. generally, just as an example, making a big effort to ramp up the manufacturing of heat pumps. And there's big efforts in the IRA to do workforce education and development. So as I think Richard mentioned, you know, we have huge workforce issues in terms of implementing a program like this. So I see, I'm hoping that gets easier over time and therefore makes expansion and this, uh, you know, hopefully the slope able to go faster, both in terms of number of heat pumps available, cost of heat pumps, people available to install them. I mean, at the same time, if you do the easy people first, easy, I don't think any of this, I shouldn't use the word easy. If you say, I mean, like the propane customers are a good place to start. We know it's cost effective to get people off propane to electricity, for example, and fuel oil. So in some respects, 
if we can get those folks in the program and done, that gets us a lot of reductions fairly early on, or could, as well as maybe lowering energy burdens for people who are on those fuels. But then you get to, to harder, harder folks, big, large, well, some cases I was about to, maybe I contradict myself, large multifamily buildings, if you can get it into a large multifamily building all at once, then that's a big chunk. But it takes a lot of effort to convince the owner of the building to do that. So I see it going both ways, Larry, in terms of what's easier and what's harder over time. And I'm happy to have Richard agree or contradict and certainly add some things. I think that was a terrific answer. Uh, you know, just think about what we would have said about an RPS 15 years ago. We all envisioned that it was going to get harder and harder and harder to, um, and more expensive to go deeper on renewables. And technology changes have, um, you know, blown that out of the water. And uh, I don't want to be Pollyanna on this, but I'd like to suggest that, yeah, there will be some hard, expensive jobs left at the end um, or further down the, the line. Um, but there will also be improvements in workforce, improvements in delivery mechanisms, improvements in technology. Uh, and uh, the, really, my bottom line on this is the only way to know is to start and get going. Uh, here, here on that one. Um, again, another angle to all this. Um, city of Boston is the largest city in uh, New England, of course. Uh, it has the, um, the building performance standard, BIRDO, that um, states are looking at adopting, other cities and towns are looking at adopting. Um, that, as I said, draw, requires large buildings to reduce their emissions over time. How would, how would a, say, how would the clean heat standard Im impact Boston or vice versa? And then how would it impact a state level version of BIRDO? Um, how would that interact with the clean heat standard? So this is a bit of a, a, a good news story, I suppose. The, the design of the clean heat standard uh, is it's essentially, we want to make sure that emissions in the thermal sector writ large go down on a pace that's consistent with the GWSA. And we don't want to trouble that we don't want to complicate the system by constantly asking who's responsible for that reduction. Something got achieved. Usually if it gets achieved in this sector, it's because five things were all done concurrently to make the change happen. And when that change happens, clean heat credits uh, can be created. So if a building owner under, even if it's an obligation, uh, to do it. If a building owner reduces emissions demonstrably on a life cycle basis, um, then clean heat credits are generated by the building owner um, or by the building owner in conjunction with the contractor. Those credits can be sold to an obligated party because real reductions really happened based on real improvements in actual buildings. <laughs> on a life cycle basis. That's what, that's what we care about. And if that makes it easier for obligated parties to meet the obligation, because these credits now are in the market, that just means costs uh, for everybody else will be lower. So we embrace that in this program design. Very good. Um, Here's a practical question, Lauren asked. Um, if the clean, clean heat standard isn't the be all and end all by itself, and there's a suite of possibilities and uh, of uh, decarbonization policies, um, how does it work? How would it work so it's not so messy to the consumer and to obligated parties? Like, so someone wants to install a heat pump at home, how do they factor in clean heat credits with uh, utility incentives? federal and state grants, and any other resources that might come down uh, the, the pike. Any ideas on how the, that would be 
designed in a way that would be somewhat streamlined? I, I'll start. I mean, I, I, my recollection in the in the Mass EE plan, and Larry, you probably know better than I do, is that they were talking almost about getting consumers coaches or advocates, someone to help them through this process. I, I think this gets to the workforce and contractor training and how we make things as easy for consumers as possible. The sort of famous, you know, one-stop shopping so that folks aren't required as we are now, having gone through some of this myself, as I'm sure many on the webinar have, trying to pull this stuff together yourself and finding a contractor who you know is reliable and getting bids. It's it's very difficult. And I think we have to make this system easier. So whether that's some kind of clearinghouse or it's what you, you called somebody a coach or, or something there has to, and maybe that's a role, you know, groups like yours, Larry, can be providing to people. Um, I, I think there's, I think we really, we, this is an area that really needs help for consumers. It gets to what Richard was saying. It's the 100,000 kitchen table conversations. It's not that we all, that we, one of us needs to be there. Somebody needs to help those people with this conversation. Uh, agreed. I, I, we don't see it as unique to the clean eat standard at all. Um, yeah. you, you know, mass yeah. save is confusing by itself. Then right. you add in um, the game-changing incentives provided by the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. Um, you know, it's all great news when you put it all together, except it does require, um, you know, a postdoctoral student to figure out how to put these things together. And, um, you, know, you know, so we do hope that that will get cleaned up. You know, the, the Clean Eat Commission, in addition to recommending the Clean Eat standard, did recommend uh, a sort of a new clearinghouse um, that of which if mass save continues it would be somewhat uh underneath that umbrella um but uh that was a good point um digging back into the issue of equity um the progressive inclusion mandate you mentioned somebody asked what does a progressive inclusion mandate look like for lmo lmi households if if i understand it what it means is that um uh lmi households would be move to the front of the line that's what we, you mean by progressive inclusion am i correct well it's it's a little more complicated than that um not not to the front of the line to the exclusion of everybody else because for a variety of reasons we we don't want lost opportunities to occur in in the, the non-lmi households but um the way it works in the Vermont legislation is, is uh, as follows, that a there, there would essentially be three types of clean heat credits under the Vermont system. One would be clean heat credits that are um, minted by actions in low income households, clean heat credits that are minted in moderate income households, and all other credits. Um, market re market residential commercial industrial um, all in in the third bucket and a every year the compliance obligation uh, on the obligated parties would be to deliver um, a at least as many low income credits as is required at least as many moderate income credits as is required. And then other credits can come from anywhere. And the, the, the number of credits calculated to come from the low and moderate income uh, segments are greater than their proportion of total households. So that's where the word progressive comes from, that is, uh, it's a larger fraction of credits from those households than those households, uh, their fraction of consumption. In fact, even right. than their fraction of the total households in the state. Right. And that's something that we tried to build into the legislation that's being offered by Representative Driscoll. Um, and we're willing to, to review that with uh, you and other stakeholders um, as this process goes forward. We want to make sure uh, we get that right. Um, the There are some questions about 
uh, the dubious nature of accounting for life cycle uh, emissions coming from biofuels, whether it's, you, there's, there's some criticism of the low carbon fuel standard in California being overly optimistic and, and such like that. Um, just to talk a little bit about how the clean eat standard would play out. Um, uh, right now we're talking about a concept, but if, if legislation moved it forward or without legislation, there was a regulation, um, you know, Nancy, this is up your wheelhouse. What's the process for moving forward on a regulation uh, like this? Is a uh, big open process subject to all kinds of, of uh, testimony and discovery, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I, my understanding is uh, that either DEP or DOER would be the lead agency for developing the regulation. Um, if it was at, at DEP in general, they would start with some a big stakeholder process to talk about issues like we've been talking about today to get input. I think DOER would do this as well, frankly. Um, talk about all these issues, gather initial input before the regulation is drafted. Then you have a draft regulation, formal public comment period. Lead agency has to respond to all of that, prepare a final regulation, and you know submit that. Is is that what you were asking, Larry? Sort of how that process works? Yeah. So so questions like uh, how much of a clean heat credit we would bestow on anything, um, right. a heat pump or biofuels or or even insulation, which we know and love so well. All that will have to get uh, sorted out and, and analyzed, correct? Yeah, I think it depends on obviously on if there's legislation, the timelines that the agencies are given to develop the rule and how much they feel they have to get done to meet whatever deadlines they have in that. And then, you know, DE, both DEP and DOER, obviously, or as time evolves, update, revise the regulations, add refinements. So some of that accounting might come later in particular depending on when things kick in when options have to be available those those kinds of things but ideally yes larry there would be a big discussion about california's low carbon fuel accounting is that sufficient do we like what's called the greet model do we want to use a different model um if so which one is it <laughs> um, um what does the spreadsheet that richard was talking about look like um so, I mean, I recall when DOER did the first RPS regulations, there were very big stakeholder meetings um, before those regs were drafted. And they've obviously changed quite a bit over time. Yep. In, in the Vermont legislation, the Vermont legislation calls for the creation of a technical advisory group, similar to the technical advisory group that we have had for uh, the energy efficiency programs, the renewables programs, the, the so-called tier three part of the renewables program, which is fossil, which is a fossil reduction mandate. Um, you know, we have a bunch of experience already with um, navigating these really technical um, decisions over time. And I'm pretty confident that any of our states can create mechanisms that would uh, enable people to come together and make these difficult decisions and evaluate the technical data. Yeah, I think it, that Richard reminded me that, you know, what kind of a role do we see for a group like the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council going forward? The EJ Advisory Council, how, I mean, I think it's a great thing for, I'm sure Secretary Tepper's thinking about this. How does she now get these groups to be working together on issues like this? Should there should some of those structures be changed, revised? What kind of a group could be set up to look at this program or at similar programs as one group? Right. A um, couple other questions. Uh, one's a fairly easy one I can answer. Is Rhode Island considering a clean heat standard? And if so, where are they in the process compared to Massachusetts and Vermont? Uh, so in our work, we uh, scrutinized pretty carefully the um, the plan that was put forward by the uh, Climate Coordinating Council in Rhode Island, um, 
their their body that put together their clean energy and climate plan for uh, 2025 and 2030. Um, and honestly, all they said they said that there should be some consideration of a clean heat standard. Uh, they weren't recommending it. Uh, they weren't uh, flagging that there would be the initiation of any kind of a regulatory process. Um, and so we are, uh, as one of our remarks, you know, in the public comment period was, you know, if they're going to do that, they should do it seriously. And if they're not going to do a clean heat standard, we did not see anything in the Rhode Island plan that would create the kind of emission reductions in the building sector that that is required by law. So I think, um, and again, part of the reason we're doing this webinar is to try to raise awareness of the clean heat standard as one of the, uh, we think it could be a very good tool in the toolkit. Um, Another very practical question. Um, would a consumer, a homeowner or a business um, who's going to do a clean eat solution, um, would the, the clean eat credits be applied uh, all up front in order to uh, incentivize the heat pump or the weatherization or something? Or would it be some based upon some assumption of the lifetime uh, benefit of that measure? Or would it be something that you sort of get a, a credit uh, accruing to you over time as it operates? That really is a good question. Um, we have modeled, first of all, there, those of us who are working on the Vermont program um, do uh, have a desire to incentivize and make possible the these long-lived measures, weatherization and uh, insulation of heat pumps, or in some cases, advanced wood heating systems in Vermont. And, and so one of the early you know, thoughts we had was, well, we'll just let all the credits be accrue um, to, the, to the installer on day one. The problem of, with doing that is that you're collapsing 15 years of credits into year one. And the credit market then basically is flooded and there's actually no value to the credits. So it's a self-defeating, turns out mathematically to be kind of a self-defeating uh, idea. So clearly the credits have to be issued in the form of, of what we call a strip of credits or a stream of credits that will, um, that are minted on day one, but they are then uh, earn their keep uh, every year thereafter over the lifetime of the measure and the so the question is what does that mean to the homeowner let's say um, the obligated party is will have an incentive to own that strip of credits because they're going to have an obligation year after year and so that will factor into the, the rebate or the incentive payment that they're willing to make to the building owner, um, but the there is a there is a commercial reality there that these credits will be worth something over the uh, the period of time that they deliver savings. Uh, very good. Um, we just have time for a couple more questions. Um, one comment was made. Um, Tanya Stasio from Applied Economics Clinic, clinic um, that organization, the Applied Economics Clinic, does great work on um, similar to regulatory assistance project, um, and, and the, they have written a paper on uh, the drawbacks or the consideration of hydrogen and renewable natural gas in solutions. Um, they have a paper that we will include in the follow-up email to everybody we'll receive after this. Um, you might, everyone might be interested in that. I've also written blogs on, you know, why we're opposing the usage of uh, renewable natural gas and, and hydrogen in the gas pipeline system. So people can look forward to that. Um, a companion policy that we're promoting at, the, at our organization is um, uh, we're endorsing the Zero Carbon Renovation Fund, um, a, a large coalition of 150 organizations are advocating for $300 million in federal money in Massachusetts being allocated to uh, energy retrofits targeting public 
uh, schools and um, affordable housing, public housing. Um, and that has uh, legislative sponsors. We're looking for co-sponsors. And um, our view is that it's a, in terms of equity, it, it's a very important to do that. That federal money is useful for that. Um, and so if Anna or Carrie could put that into the chat, we would like to encourage people to um, go to a link and you can send a short letter to your state senator or representative uh, endorsing, asking them to co-sponsor the Zero Carbon Renovation Fund. Um, because we think it's a great policy, but, uh, but I really want to make the point that $300 million may sound like a lot of money. Uh, it is to me personally, but in the context of the challenge to decarbonize bu buildings, it's it's not. And so we think of it as a down payment, and uh, we're looking for uh, long-term solutions. And that's essentially why we're so happy to have the Regulatory Assistance Project here today. Um, and, uh, you know, Richard or Nancy, do you have any reflection on, on that point that I'm trying to make, which is that... Uh, you're 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 trying to look at this in terms of uh, creating a, a framework that that is will continue um, over time, correct? Sure. Um, that's our climate goals require continued reductions year after year um, towards 88 to 90 to 100 percent reductions in this sector. So we need a a policy framework that will be assured to deliver those savings. And that's what a clean heat standard is all about. It's not a little bit here, a little bit there, and let's pray that we get to our goals. It's a performance standard that would ensure the framework for that. Yep. Um, well, we're approaching 1.30. This went by uh, 90 minutes kind of quickly. Um, and we, we still have some questions uh, available. What I'm going to do is uh, work with my staff and Richard and, and Nancy, if you don't mind. If there are questions that we, I'll email you and we'll, we'll try to answer those and get those answers to questions out uh, via a follow-up email to everybody. Um, but I think this was, this accomplished what I wanted, which was to inform uh, a lot of interested uh, uh, active people who are active in their community and some policymakers about the policy. I think people are going to hear more about it. Um, you know, we we just had a big midterm election and a whole lot going on uh, in the United States, and 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 obviously we both states, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, just elected uh, governors and other constitutional officers. Uh, and so issues like this, even though they were in uh, important climate plans, kind of went under the radar screen. Um, but I think 2023. What I'm hearing is a lot of interest among legislators to do something about building decarbonization. And uh, so I think this is helpful to help frame this. Um, we'll come back to this topic and also others relating to building decarbonization over the next uh, few months. Um, so on behalf of our organization, I just want to thank you, Richard and Nancy, very, very much. And everybody else, have a great afternoon. All right. Thanks to everybody. Happy to be and here. We look forward to the questions. Yes. Thank you, Larry. Thanks. Take care.